The show is about to start. Thank you for your cooperation. Enjoy the show, and please come back and visit us again. Indeed, the table is set for the latest edition of the Nine Years Podcast, the AFC Wimbledon Audio Fanzine. It is Thursday, August the 10th, and I am Nick Draper, joined once again by Crawley's number one Ray Wilkins tribute act, Stuart Deacons. And isn't it great that proper football is back? This week we'll be discussing our first two games of the season and previewing the weekend's action as we host Shrewsbury, or Shrewsbury, however you want to say it. We also catch up with an AFC Wimbledon CCL original, Mr... Andy Sullivan. But before all that, Stu, as I say, two matches to review, and we'll tackle them individually. Let's start with the most recent, the Brentford game in the Milk Cup. We've fallen at the first hurdle again, albeit not helped by our injury list on this occasion. We can talk about ten changes that Brentford made to their starting lineup, but they are still picking from a championship squad, and we're starting that game without Darius Charles, Jonathan Meads, Jimmy Abdu, Liam Trotter, and Kwesi Hapaya, who I would suggest would all be in Neil's first choice 11. Tom Saw is also featuring on that list as well, potentially. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. Um, it was interesting, wasn't it? On... Was it interesting now? Already, yes, that buzzword. Yeah, oh. we, we said, didn't we, on our Facebook Live that we um, we had live on Tuesday night. That I fancied us with 10 changes. You know, you've got to fancy if a team makes that much changes. But we were we were fooled by the Brentford setup, and uh, they've got some they got some squad. But, yeah, I think we were we were dampened by the fact that we had... The, the players we had out injured, it was just, you know, they were key players in midfield who would have all put their foot in. You know, Meansy can play in midfield, Jimmy Abdu can play in midfield, Liam Trotter. Darius can play in midfield as well, and you know, and even the luxuries of Tom Saws as well. So yeah, that area was what really killed us on Tuesday night. But um, it was an it was a great game, wasn't it? So close to a second interest of the show, uh, less than two minutes in, so close. But yeah, you're right. In the midfield, the midfield three are George Frankham, Dean Parrott, and 17 year old debutant Anthony Hartigan. I do want to highlight that. This is no reflection of their respective abilities, but as you've touched on there, it's probably fair to say the balance between those three isn't the best. There isn't that more defensively minded player. George Frankham is the most defensively minded of them. He's not best suited to that sort of play. No, and um, if you think about the three that play, George Frankham is probably the only one that's really got a defensive awareness, if that's being the side of it. You know, George knows playing right back, he, so he's he's got an awareness of tackling. It's interesting to hear Andy Haskins Don's, uh, sorry, I follow interview where he said, you know, Neil Ardy has said to him and he's got to be aware of the ball and his defensive um, positioning. So he's already aware of that and he's 17 years old. He'll, there'll be no harm done in playing that game on Tuesday night and he'll learn so much from it from a, an exciting, as we say, 17-year-old. You say he will learn loads from that, won't do any harm, but it's not ideal for him to have played 120 minutes, is it? Or is that just me? He's 17 years old, Nick. I know, but it's it's a big step up, isn't it? To go into your first first team start against the championship side. I think he come out unscathed. I think he can now... I think he says it again, if, if people have not seen his interview, it's a really good interview. He, and he's very shy, and he's um, he's not had his media training yet. So uh, Rob Cornell had his work cut out when he had to interview him. But, you know, he said, he did say early on that he wasn't too sure if he fitted... Um, if he should have been in the in the change room, so he wasn't too sure whether he was part of the first team squad or should be part of the first team squad. He said the first team squad now have made him very welcome and play 120 minutes with a near enough first team. I know we've got injuries, but he's still playing like you know George Long, Barry Fuller, Desi Alaja. You know he's still in the first team mix, and that surely will make him feel that actually, do you know what, he does belong in the first team, and he did his chances no harm whatsoever. I was. I've been not critical, but I didn't think. I suppose he set such high standards um, that I think I was disappointed with the midfield. His defensive awareness, I just we didn't get the ball enough. So I didn't think. I wouldn't say Andy Hartley had a great game, but in the long term of his development, it ain't gonna do him any harm whatsoever. I guess, and I know we know that Neil Lardley is very careful in regards to his younger players, and he's not going to put them in any positions where he doesn't feel like they're going to thrive. I think you just summed it up there when you talked about his interview and the fact we've mentioned before that he's a fairly quiet player, still needs to come out of his shell a little bit. I suppose confidence was the word I was looking for earlier. It could have been a little bit of not to his confidence. Not that he was at all at fault for any of the goals really himself individually. The third goal, I think he came off worse than a 50-50 and you could see his frustration immediately afterwards. 
I was just one just didn't want him to have any confidence knocks that might set his progress back a little bit, I suppose. That was my my worry. I think you've probably addressed that perfectly well though, and put my mind at ease. Yeah, I would say and it was very quickly in his interview he did actually acknowledge that his it was at fault for the third goal, which was sometimes players don't do that. It's good if you can accept responsibility and he did say that he, he should have flicked it round or he should have held his body stronger to get a foul. So it, I, I quite like that. You know, even though he's quiet, there was a maturity of actually accepting responsibility and didn't shy away from that. So um, I think we all know we've got a hell of a plough on our hands. And um, yeah, the future's bright. Shall I finish off that famous advertising line or shall I just move on? we move on. The other thing that struck me, well, there were many things that struck me, but one thing in particular during the 90 minutes on Tuesday was the intensity. We spent long periods chasing the ball, but then when we, when we won it back, they pressed us very, very quickly. They pressed us in twos and threes. We switched on to that, realised getting the ball wide was our best options. Lyle Taylor, Barry Fuller especially, although I think Barcham and Callum Kennedy actually did quite well on the other side as well. But did the lack of the target man, the big man up front, was that a restriction for us? Yeah, I'm... I'm sort of old school, so you know, you and I have both been brought up on the... on the. Well, I had the John Fashion, he was my first sort of target man, I can remember. Yours. You were brought up on the Martin Peters and Jeff Hursts. <laughs> no, no, no. John Fashion, you and John Gales of this world. And, <laughs> well, you know, I'm, obviously you're going back, you know, I think about John Hartson, Marcus Gale, Bayo, Tom Eddie, obviously last season. I think Steve we always... Howard at Luton. <laughs> yeah, who can forget Steve Howard? I think we always feel that we should need a... <laughs> sorry, there's probably, sorry to interrupt you again. There's probably so many people listening right now going, who, who the hell is Steve Howard? <laughs> who is that? Have a Google. Have a, have a Google it. Yeah, Google, Google it. it, as they say nowadays. I think, I always think we need a target man. You know, we've got a pitch that is like a carpet out there. So we've recruited in a certain way. The official, st- it's interesting, the official stats say that 55% possession was for Brentford. We actually, had a bit, we actually had a bigger share of the percentage of scum for, according to the official stats. But it felt like Brentford had the ball a hell of a lot. I think it was just the target man is that we didn't have that out ball. But it's interesting. Um, I was listening to an interview. <laughs> and I've used that word again, haven't I? I was, used, I was listening to an interview and it said actually sometimes having Tom Elliott meant that went front to back very quickly in terms of play the long ball because you've got it. So we, we didn't. It's one of those things. If you haven't got it, then you try and play out. But. We tried to play out a few times and we just got swamped in the midfield areas. The, the space was wide. And I think we started to work out in the second half that the space was actually with Barry Fuller, uh, Andy Bartram and that. But we tried to take too many touches in the midfield and Brentford was so effective of hunting in numbers and they just, they won a lot of ball in such dangerous areas for us. Um, but again, we can only learn from that. Brentford are a, a, a quality championship team and um, they spent a bit of money to get them sort of players so we can't be too disheartened. With our striker options at the moment then, we know what Cody McDonald, Lyle Taylor and Andy Bartram, we all know what they offer us, but do they complement each other? Do they really work as a front three? I know we've talked about getting the ball wide and Lyle and Bartram were the ones coming right out, almost hugging the touchline at times. But surely we need something a little bit different. Yeah, I think we do. And that's the, and that's, is it the target man? Do you know what I mean? That's the obvious thing. You know, everyone goes target man, target man. We haven't addressed that. I mean, it's gone really quiet on that front, hasn't it? You know, we, there was the rumours of Michael Smith, but by all accounts, he's on a, he's on a sizable salary at Pompey. So there has to be some negotiations done if we're going to get anywhere near being able to attract him back to Kings Meadow. Yeah, McDonald, I like McDonald. You know, you know what you're going to get of him. He's going to work hard, puts himself about. Likes to get in the in the penalty spot area, so he will score most of his goals in the area from what I see. Lyle will always go out wide, will work hard, play more as a right back on Tuesday night. He had to push back so much. Andy Bartram, you've got to trick him, you know, get down to the touchline. Don't forget, obviously, we've got um, Quezzi Apaya, who well, was a different one, plays on the shoulders. So we've all we've got different types of players, whether they complement them each other. That's another question. I don't think we can judge just yet. We did well up at Scum. We did well up at Scumfall, which we obviously discussed in a little while. Um, I don't think you can retake too much from last night. So we we probably need probably a month of games before we can really see whether they they complement and what you know, give us what we need. It's a very good point because, of course, at this stage of the season, we're all very excited that the season's underway. We do tend to get a little bit carried away, of course. Usually, we're up running two games into the season, but hey, they publish a league table after. Well, straight from kickoff, I think three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon these days on the opening day. So maybe you need to get away from almost this instant gratification. That's a big word. I don't know what it means, but yeah, I sound that's right. Yeah, there's, there's two words in fact. But anyway, let's talk about the goals then from Tuesday night. 
when they came, they did come from mistakes, to be honest. First one, Will Nightingale, he gives the ball away in our own half. Why does that and how does that happen? Somebody that's been encouraged and has been doing very well in bringing the ball out and passing the ball out from the back. What changed? What went wrong on Tuesday? Well, I think, yeah, I alluded to it in the, in the previous, what we've mentioned before. It's just the, the pressure that Brentford did and high pressure as well. So they weren't frightened to go and attack our centre half. So even though um, we all know Robbo is probably not the, most, not the most comfortable, but they actually did attack Will Nightingale as well. They didn't give him a moment at all. And they, they swamped in numbers where, so it became very difficult to pick passes and and that's probably not the worst game I've seen Will play but it's the most it's the only game I've actually seen him play for a long while I can remember where he looked under pressure and was getting he got a bit of an ear roll from um, Barry Fuller after the first goal and it's the first game an ear full ear roll ear full yeah same sort of thing isn't it do you know what I mean he was getting earwake as I sort of called it but he looked like for he looked like it wasn't biting, it wasn't biting on what Barry Fuller was saying, but he looked for the first time that he knew maybe he was getting a real it was a tough game. It was a tough game for them out there. So I think the reason we got caught was because they put they put, put a high pressure on us, made us play. We, we knew we couldn't go long, so we tried to play into the, the side angles. And that's where the goal came from. I wish in a way when I look back at it, we I wish in a way we'd committed a foul. Will got a bit of a chasing on the on the corner side and could have taken him out. George doesn't really tackle. Um, for me, goes in a little bit half-hearted. If you give a free kick out there, they're going to have to do a wonderful free kick to score a goal. And I felt we were getting tired. We'd been chasing possession. It was about breaking the game up, breaking the game up into where we could waste a bit of time. We're a bit too nice for that. And um, when the goal comes, it's a great strike. But there's there's many things you can pick holes in if you want to be ultra-critical. We could have lost the game before, well, during the 90 minutes. One incident in particular, just before extra time, before the end of the game, Josef Zoon, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. I'm sure you have. Please don't blame me if I haven't. He gets through one-on-one. -on -one. George Long comes rushing out of his box to block. He gets himself in a very awkward position down on the ground. Um, unusual save to make. But from our view, so we were in the main stand in line with the 18-yard line at that end. It looked like it's come off his chest all day long. I'm sitting there, I suppose you were the same, Stu, just expecting and waiting for it to come off his hands in that situation. But it seemed to get away with it. It came off his chest. Others from behind the goal say it was his hands. Looking back at the video, kind of inconclusive for me. What do you think? I must admit, I've not seen it back on the video. I've only had the opportunity to see it live. And he looks like, I think he's starting, I think some people are like, why was he so far out? And um, I suppose people don't like the sweeper keeper, as you call him. I think his starting position is very good because if he's a bit further back, the player's got to clean one on one and can round him or, or do what he likes. He sort of comes out and he sort of goes out body you know spreads his body out but keeps his arms from what i can remember you might you might correct me because obviously you've seen it again but seems to make sure that if he's going to make any contact it's going to be his midriff or stuff like that what happens after that is is immaterial because if it's if it's hand to ball then of course it's it's a it's a free kick and potential sending off but if it ricochets and it hits his hands well that can't he can't control that so i think the referee gave him the benefit of the doubt he did make he made me uncomfortable because he started then looking at his linesman, then talking to the keeper. I'm like, what are you doing about that? Yeah, it was a very strange situation where you're just almost waiting for him to pull out a Ricard. Yeah, you just weren't too sure what he'd made and whether he wanted to get advice from the linesman, who probably bottled it as well. The only interesting thing is, is obviously if we've got a few friends who, who are in the John Green stand, and they said that he did wink as he went back facing towards them, as if maybe he had got a bit of a let off. But I think he deserved it from the fact that his starting position was so good that he, I thought he deserved what luck he got. Unfortunately... He wasn't helped out by our defenders for the second goal, where we have totally fallen asleep at a corner. Yeah, and looking back, it looks like um, Edgy Kaja is the one that, I say, at fault, picking up. Um, they've done that in the first half, though, as well. Um, we, we were down there, and we were down that end on the first half. They did that in the first half, so I don't think it's, I don't think it's about blaming players as such. I think that's where tired minds comes into it. Of course, Edgy Kaja come on as a fourth sub, which, of course, is um, a new thrust because, obviously, you get the extra sub now going into extra time. So he come on, and you could probably be, almost be forgiven for the fact that maybe he didn't know who was picking up. A bit of tiredness in the back four of not actually shouting because we're normally quite good at that. And I think it was just a mixture, but it's, it's not 
not a great goal, is it? You know, he gets the ball, can have a look, curls it. It doesn't really curl it. For me, it doesn't really curl it in a top corner. If you look at where the ball ends up, i just not too sure whether George Long's too far over. We don't react as a team, and in the end, it's a little bit of a powder puff goal, to be honest with you. But by then, I think by then, we were all like, are we going to survive towards a penalty shootout, which we thought was unlikely. Yeah, and I think the third goal is immaterial, really, because... In extra time, I think we all got the sense that this game was going away from us, or getting away from us, and it was only a matter of time, really. We were clinging on for penalties, I think. But it could have all been different. Cody McDonald, what a chance he had to make it 2-0. Good save from the keeper, I think, pushed it up against the crossbar in the end. Yeah, I think it'd been, I think it'd been harsh on a goalkeeper. I think it wasn't just a good save, it's an, ex- it's an outstanding save. When you look at it, Cody, when he, gets, when he gets the header, I don't think he's no more than six yards, if that. Keeper managed to get it close to his body, gets onto the crossbar, reacts, does what all keepers should do and, and, and spreads himself and Cody gets a good strike and it hits his, his left hand. The keeper deserves everything he gets there, really. He deserved the luck. But at 2-0, you could argue that that's a match-winning save. Because at 2-0, I fancy that we would have had that momentum, that confidence to probably go on and win that game I still think they would have scored because we couldn't keep giving away that possession but it would have forced them into a an attacking move in terms of subs but it's a hell of a save for all the, for all the chances I, I looked at you know Brentford had 29 shots with 11 on target we had 12 with 7 on target so in terms of when we had our chances we had I don't know I think we must have about three good good opportunities so from the limited possession we have we did really well and um if not not for their keeper doing saving it we would have i think we'd have been in a draw for the um the next round we're never in the draw for the next round this just doesn't happen i don't even think there is a next round i've never seen it well i have seen it but not for for how many years now do you know what the last time we were in the league cup before afc before we reformed we got knocked out in the first round didn't we away at brighton if you remember was that at the old um the athletic stadium what they called that i forgot yeah, the Withdean Stadium. That's it, and I, if I remember properly, and this probably will show my age, a young Bobby Zamora scored against us. That was going to be the next thing I said, yeah. He scored both, I believe. Did he score two? Oh, I remember the first one. I don't know about the second one I switched off. I think I think it was both of them. I could be wrong on that one, but I know he was definitely on score at least once. So, Brett, if you're listening, maybe one day he will do it in a Wimbledon shirt. Maybe one day. We shall see. Anyway, when we did score against Brentford, when the goal did come, it was a bit of a strange one. I have not seen many stranger goals. I don't think you would have done either in our time watching Wimbledon. Maybe a Viking Greenford let it roll under your foot type way, but other than that. Or a Will Antwee 50p header against Hartlepool one random Tuesday evening. But <laughs> is it just the flight of the ball? Is it the trajectory of the ball as it's hitting or heading towards the far post that the defender on the line just, just Yeah, when you look back at it, I, I didn't know. I couldn't quite work out. I can remember the, I can remember the short corner... I think if I'm, if I'm not angry, Barcham or Lyle Taylor takes a shot, then another shot, and it ricochets around. And then I just remember seeing the ball loop up. Obviously, looking back on the replay, um, Paul Robson gets a, a great touch on it. He sort of like wraps his right foot around the defender, gets just gets the most weirdest lob. And in the end, the keeper has a player next to him. I don't think any of them called a keeper. I'm sorry, the player thinks he's going to smash into the post. The ball then hits the post and drops in. So yeah, it was a weird sort of goal, but as they say, they all count. And whoever had Jimmy Abdu as first goal scorer at Scunthorpe and Paul Robinson as the first goal scorer against Brentford, they have probably retired to a mansion in the country right now. I don't think you can ever foresee, especially when we talk about the attacking talent in our squad now, <laughs> they would be our first two goal scorers of the season. But it is a funny old game. Talking about the Scumthorpe game then, you agree that a draw on balance was a fair result? It's difficult to say on balance. Look at the, if you look at possession, we dominate possession at Scumthorpe and have more chances. Yeah, we take, you know, I said, look, we'll take a draw before the game starts. I sort of left, I left a little bit, sort of a bit disappointed that we just didn't take those chances. You could say a draw is a fair result. I, I think Scumthorpe took the draw, but we, we had some really good chances to save on the line from the keeper, great hand. And the Lyle Taylor chance where I, Cody didn't get down to the byline and then Lyle just sort of gets a bit of an air shot. We, yeah, we had some great chances and we could have come away from three points. So a place that is going to potentially hold the playoff, one of the, one of the playoff potential teams. So, um, yeah, we done well. We did do particularly well in the second half. That's where you mentioned those two great chances there. What changed after the break? I just think we were a bit more um, adventurous. I just felt that 
we were a little bit just trying to find our way into the game. Scunthorpe got the early goal, which was a good a good goal when you when you look at reflection. It's a good, good good a good goal. You can you can pick holes in our defending all day long, but it's a good it's a good move. Um, but they they sort of sat back as if they were happy to go one nil up into the half time. But I think what we did the second half, we we played a bit further forward. So when we won those when we won those balls in midfield, we actually were in good areas. We played at a better tempo. We went directly towards them. We worked the angles very well. You know, we worked down the sides quite well. Uh, and in the end, you know, we were scumful. Were, were holding on. Let's not let's, let's not beat around the bush on that. They were holding on, and um, they would have been probably more pleased to hear the final whistle than we would really. Talk about winning the ball back and putting on pressure higher up the pitch. And I know we've mentioned about our midfield on Tuesday night, but just how good were our midfield three on Saturday? Abdu, lots of people have been talking about his performance and clearly his goal. George Frankham and Liam Trotter, who maybe gone under the radar a little bit. How good were they, especially in that second half? Yeah, well, you know, there was a few I. A few eyebrows raised, wasn't there, that George Franklin got a nod over Dean Parrott. That was the obvious either or, wasn't it? I, I said on the build-up from last week on our podcast that it was either or, and my, I, I wasn't overly surprised to see George Franklin go there. It is a position he's played before. He has got that defensive nod. He's got a defensive nous. As where he, Whereas maybe he didn't work against Brentford, he had two good, two good solid players alongside him, and Liam Trotter and Jimmy Abdu. They worked well in... They worked well as a free. They, they hunted well. They hunted down the ball so they forced errors they won second balls in midfield we haven't you know, we talk about a target man we haven't got the most tallest front line but what Cody and Lyle when he come on and so forth managed to do was give enough of a nudge and enough of a presence for then Liam Trotter to be able to pick up the scraps so he picked up the scraps really well and that's what they're going to do is I think you know Jimmy he's a very unassuming person isn't he Jimmy you know I mean? took his goal very well but I think a likeable character. I think he's going to be a fan's favourite. He's always smiling, isn't he? He always seems very, very happy, in contrast to perhaps a couple of other players in our squad, who shall remain nameless for the time being. Some people that wouldn't have been happy on Saturday would have been Scunthorpe's front three. I thought we did very, very well keeping them quiet. We talked about this on Facebook Live, actually. Paddy Madden, Hakeem Adelarkin, and then obviously Josh Morris, a 20-goal strike from last season. Apart from a few few moments from Adelarkin, really, didn't feel threatened by those guys at all. No, and you're right. You know, When you think Josh Morris got 20 goals, you have to wonder... If I'm amazed he's not gone, mm, I've uh, been truthful. You know, is it a case he wasn't he wasn't as effective as I've seen him last season? Is that because maybe there's a potential of a move going on, or because I think if he doesn't move now, he's got a potential of missing the boat. You know, trying. You know, that's, that's a little bit. He wasn't great. I didn't last season when we played him. I was a little bit concerned when he played and he got the ball. You were like, he can make things happen. I never really felt he. Could, I never really felt he was going to do that. So you wonder whether actually there's something going on there and you may see him move before the window's finished. But um, yeah, Paddy Madden, totally forgot if I'm being truthful that he was playing. Is that because of our back four? Keeping yeah, a good I job on so. them? Or was it the fact we were restricting the supplies, those players? What was the main reason? I think a bit of both. I think a bit of both. I think we hunted well in the midfield. So in the end, we restricted any balls really going into them. So we starved them a little bit, really. It wasn't a surprise when they made the changes. But Deji... Um, I I like Deji. I was I I was I was I'm ignoring whether actually Deji last season at I didn't think was great when I saw him against us. I've said that a number of times, but this preseason and the start of the season, he just looks outstanding. And um, you can see it's something we missed. Comfortable with the ball at his feet. He's he's a nightmare probably to play against because he's always up against you, and he's quite happy to take you on with the ball as a centre half, which will get, probably gets in troubles a few times through the season. But we we stopped him. We stopped the Boston, and that's what in the end we starved him of any joy. All right, three word reports from the Scunthorpe game from our Twitter page at 9YRS Podcast. You can check out hashtag Don's three word report for all of these, as long as those of you that have sent reports to us have used the hashtag. Otherwise, they might be lost for eternity. Who knows? But anyway, thank you very much for all of you who probably had loads this Saturday. Our favourite three this week. We're going to start with Zach Thompson at Mr. T Thompson, who went with watching Don's overseas in reference to the new iFollow service that appeared to be, on the whole, very successful for everyone watching from wherever they may have been around the globe, from Germany to Greater Manchester. Nick McJanet, at Nick underscore McJanet. He went for boom, season on. I love that. Season underway. Good performance, good point. Only going to get better, we expect. And then finally, Mark E, at Marky Womble. He went for Jimmy's Iron Maiden. Did you see that one, Stu, before now? Is that your first experience of that particular pun? Yeah, no, I've just seen that. That was quite good. I get that. <laughs> you sound like me when someone's done a really bad piece of work in class. I was going, yeah, that's 
Good. Yep. Yeah. Well, well done. Well, well done. done. Well done. I'm not, very, I'm not very good at it. I'm not very good at a three word report, Jamie. You know I, mean? I normally. I try and think and then give up, and then I see Ray Armfield join Chuck one in and think, oh, yeah, why do I not think of that? Yeah, there's a reason for that. I think Ray Armfield did go for, what was it, Don's Scunny Delight. Yes, which is very clever. Um, anyway, we will be doing three-word reports throughout the season, but we're also going to mix them up as well over this coming year with some other post-game summaries, so keep an eye out for those. We're going to start those from this Saturday, as I say, at 9YRS Podcast. Quick look around League One on the opening day. It's during the games we were looking out for. We mentioned Southend versus Blackburn and Berry versus Warsaw, the only Polish team in the division. Debutants in both games scored winning goals. It was Michael Kiley for Southend, Jermaine Beckford for Berry, and I expect both players to be at the top of the goal scoring charts or around there come the end of the season. Yeah, do you know what was interesting? Uh, Knightley. I bet it was. <laughs> well, he spent most of his career in a championship or premiership, last 10 years, either or. So Southend have really picked up a good sign there, haven't they? It's only actually, I'm tipping Southend to probably get a third automatic. Third automatic playoff place? No, it's the top three. Third? Yeah. Cause... Third automatic playoff place. Yeah. Well, no oh, one. I think they get third this year and probably potentially could get into the top two. When you look at strike force, they really should. You know, they've improved from last year. So you can see him getting goals. Beckford didn't actually realize. I thought Beckford was older than, what I, older than what I thought. He's actually only 33. 33 years young, he is. Last time in League One, last time in League One, scored 30 goals for Leeds. So I know Leeds are a different proposition to Bury, but yeah, it's good to score goals. So yeah, it should be interesting to see what they do. Other notable news from the weekend was a number of red cards. I think there were five in total in League One, which I think is fairly unique for an opening day. You normally see so many on the first game of the season. There was one for Mr. Keith Keane of Rochdale, who we mentioned last week. Do you know this was his third dismissal this calendar year? Is that because he's playing at centre-half when he really is a centre midfielder? Yeah, spot on. <laughs> spot on. He's not a centre-half. <laughs> when he played together, when he played down at our place, I was loving the fact he was playing centre-half because he just doesn't look... I know as you get I know as you get older and you get slower, people move you back. I get that. No, he should just not play. Do you know what I mean? I just... Um... Yeah, not a surprise. A dismissal as well. Not to, was it a straight red or was it a second yellow? I've got a feeling it was a second yellow. Okay, I thought it was a straight red. Um, I have to, to check. I thought it was for a denying a goal scoring opportunity. Yeah, possibly. It was last man. He cut across someone. So possibly it is actually a UA card. Do you know what? Our game was quite interesting actually because they, I've said it again, and I we have to find a different word. But the reason it was interesting was because the only booking of the whole game. Surprisingly, gum for booking Jimmy Abdu for celebrating an equaliser, for apparently going into a crowd where the crowd was literally on top of him anyway. Yeah, I don't get referees. The, the booking, the booking for celebrations is just an absolute joke. And you've got more chance now for being booked from scoring a goal than you have for just literally doing a Vinnie Jones taking someone out nowadays. It's pathetic. Right over. Good. What was your pick of the results from League One over the weekend? Uh, Southampton beating Blackburn. I think it's okay. I think it's a big win. I think Blackburn will do okay this year. Um, so Southampton starting the season off well. Didn't start off too well last year. Um, I really fancy them. I really do. I think they've got a good, good team. And I'm not looking forward to playing them again because they normally stuff us, don't they? Really down at our place. They normally do, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's a good win. I think it's a good win. I think Blackburn would do okay, and um, yeah, that was my pick. Fleetwood beating Rotherham. I don't, I don't see Rotherham oh, as. One, yeah, Fleetwood. I just don't see Rotherham doing too much. Do you know why I picked that one? Only because I know Fleetwood beat them in the playoff semi-finals last year. Very disappointing once they actually got to the semi-finals. I think last year, almost raised the white flag a little bit. Didn't really turn up for them. But I thought it was important for them to kick off the season with a win, because actually, yeah. I think of the if you consider there are nine teams that would have lost in the playoffs last season I think only two of them actually won I think I've got that right on the weekend one of them was being Luton with just your 8-2 I think Fleetwood are the other ones oh Bradford sorry yeah Bradford did as well but no other than that um, Scunthorpe obviously not because we took a point off them so I think it's good that also their new signing got a couple of goals McElhaney so perhaps one to watch this season finally your hero and villain of the week we've both got hero and villain so do you want to do your hero first well, my hero is um, Coutar. Uh, I don't know what he is. The Chelsea goalkeeper. Coutar, <laughs> um, Coutar. I don't know what he's called. Um, okay. He's my hero because he gave me something to laugh at. It was. I, I can never not. I can never not laugh at Chelsea. And what better than the Chelsea goalkeeper trying to be a forward? Kicks it into row Z, which is an achievement at Wembley. And um, yeah, he's my hero just for giving me such such a comedy value. Glad to hear it. My one was actually George Frankham, which is boring in comparison. But I just think two games can't really have too many discussions or debates about his merit 
in the team on the back of those two games. And I think, if you remember, a couple of years ago, we went to Leighton Orient away. We actually recorded some of the podcasts, I say live, but you know what I mean, from there, from Brisbane Road. And that day, George Franklin played in centre midfield. And that day, we looked at him and thought, do you know what? This could work out for him in this position where he can get on the ball and make things happen. Didn't quite have that opportunity so far, or hasn't had quite that opportunity so far, because of the nature of the games and the nature of the opposition and how they've treated him. But he's put a real shift in. So, yes, the propaganda machine is underway on the Nine Years podcast for George Franklin. Who was your villain of the week? Well, my villain was an organisation in terms of FIFA. Why, you know, just as much as I laughed about the penalty... Why change the penalty shootout? I just don't understand it. The ABBA, the ABBA well, warning. Does it does it make that much of a difference, really? No, and that's what I mean. Why muck around with something? The penalty format, it, it works. There's always. I think they did it to try and take away the fact that the advantage of the first penalty. Uh, we toss a coin for that. Don't change something. Penalty shootout's been around for ages, hasn't it? Do you know what I mean? And um, yeah, there's other things you could change um, that would be of more benefit rather than changing a penalty shootout. Fair enough. My villain of the week is the Scunthorpe PA guy. <laughs> wow, yeah. He was hyper beyond belief at half time. And even if we hadn't have been trying to record Facebook Live stuff, which actually with quality of the microphone you've got there, Stu, not that much of a problem. Just so irritating. His voice was literally going right through me. I wanted to run on the pitch and just yell at him to just stop talking, to just shut up. Give me a headache. I would have joined you. He needs to know his place. Yes, know your place. Know your role and shut your mouth. You're listening to These Fine Gentlemen and their new song, One Horse Town. Available now on iTunes and Spotify. I've been joined by Andy Sullivan. I consider a Wimbledon original, an AFC Wimbledon original. You weren't at the very, very first game at Sun, were you? But you were certainly with us in that first pre-season. I was indeed, yeah. So um, I came along in the second game, which was uh, against Dulwich Hamlet. So um, two friends of mine were here already and went to the trials on the common. Um, that was Andy Hunt, who was the goalkeeper, and Danny Roberts, who was the left-back. And um, I knew those guys from when I was a Southampton Apprentice. So and he was a Brentford well, player, which and uh, Andy Hunt was. So uh, they said, look, you know, Terry, we know this guy, he's in Sainz Town. Are you interested? So I'm like, oh, can I come along? You know, I read about it in the press, and it's great. And I was like, take a step down from the Ryman into into the Combine Counties. But as soon as I played that game, it was like fantastic. It's brilliant. Cause everyone was following the story because of what happened with franchise and milkies and everyone got it everyone got it even in non-league everyone got it you think of your the club basketball Liverpool it's like moving the club you know 70 miles somewhere else take the soul away but look at it now you know it's like kudos isn't it? so before we started recording you were talking about your first season in the CCO and you said that you were amongst one of the highest bookings or you receive the highest number of bookings of all the players. I can't believe in a team with Danny Oakins and Simon Batty and Keith Ward that your name would feature among the biggest number of bookings I know um, so especially with people like Danny Oakins and Ian Batty and, uh, and Keith Ward yeah it was when I look back and some of the books are out I've got the highest disciplinary record but to be fair it wasn't the tackles it was probably for my own mouth if anything else but there we are frustrating and obviously you were there for the first game league game against Sandhurst at Sandhurst Town which is a memorable occasion the first league game down here at Kings Meadow where we are right now correct me if I'm wrong though your first goal was against Reading Town was it down here you, in a 2-0 win yeah. and how many do you, do you know how many you went on to get that season double figures at least surely I think it was about 11 or 12 yeah, so, so it wasn't too bad from, from the wing sides for supplying. Um, and I always let Kevin Cooper know that when he lords it about his goals, just remember who supplied it was me and Lee Sidwell. <laughs> yeah, I think we all remember that team really well. You had Lee Sidwell on one side, you on the other. Cooper, obviously, Joe Sharon up top. And then Matt Everard joined us late in the season. He's got a bit of legendary status with us, really. What are your memories of some of the bigger games that season? We had our big rivals were AFC Wallingford. I think you actually scored straight from a corner, did you, against them? If I've got my memory correct? Uh, a little bit of luck in that. I've, I always went to try and get it on uh, Matt Evans' head, so it was always from the left side, it'd be a left in swinger, from the right, it'd be right side. So I'd always take with uh, either, either foot. And on that occasion, I whipped it, but it wasn't the best corner. 
and because uh, it, it's bounced in the, in the goal mouth, Dunny Oakwood has run across it and it's completely put the keeper off and it's just carried on going in the, in the corner. So I've just ran straight up here and got mobbed by Sean Daly, everyone else. And it was, it was sweet for me because Alex Wallenford had uh, Shane Small Ping, who later came to us. And uh, Shane's looked at both of me and Matt Everard when he scored from the corner, he's gone, from the free kick, and he's gone. There you go. It was, when I was doing my celebration, I looked at him and uh, <laughs> so it was a good little bit of banter. <laughs> um, you, with that game as well, do you have to remember, we, that was a big game for us. It was almost a coming-of-age game when we beat Wallingford 3-2 that day. But Keith Ward clearing one off the line. Do you remember that? Do you remember, and was it, was it over the line? Uh, well... I, I actually don't remember that, but what I do remember is the noise that day, because I think the sponsors for the game, ironically, were some of the, the lads, I can't remember what they were called, yeah, and, and they were, I think they were Scotch Mist early doors, to the point where they were really, really set off here, but it was infectious, because the chance of going around the ground, you could really hear it, and I think I've, I've got the, the video or DVD, and it's... It's really, really loud when you're on DVD. Out of curiosity, you'll see nowadays it's packed all the time, and back in them days it was packed. Did that? Did the fan base give you that extra? Did it give you any pressure, or did it drive? Because obviously, some players I can imagine actually it probably didn't. Maybe they didn't mean they could express themselves. But did you have a problem with that? Did it be, did it make you more motivated? For for me, it gave me extra impetus. So it, for, for us, it was like brilliant. How many have we got today? Look at look at that over there. Fantastic. As soon as you came out. We had that roar because the season before I was playing for Staines Town and with respect, 200 fans tops that you're going to get there. Not really atmosphere, just people that love to go to football. Great. AFC Wimbledon, two seasons prior, watching the Premier League. And we're looking at these people going, oh my God, they're watching us. Not professionals, but we're giving everything we've got for the club and they're with us. And it's brilliant. And, And that's... We wanted to give something back to what the situation was and at the same time drive forward. And, you know, we didn't manage it the first season, but we certainly did the second season. So, um, and for, to do it so quickly, and everyone that was involved, it's been fantastic. So, so you were involved in a team with Simon Batty, yeah. who now has gone through all the... So he's gone from player, coach, system manager, and obviously the, the final link, obviously, going back then. Have you got him... Was he always a saint? Have you got any stories or... How was he in the dressing room? Because he's quite a big motivator, isn't he? How was he? How was he? Obviously, when he played, how was he? It's classified. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Bass has always been um, a terrific character. I mean, two years prior to me being at of Wimbledon, I went to um, Aldershot, where, funny enough, we had uh, Michael Harvey, also known as, and um, Bass was there. But Bass was injured at the time. But he was a massive character there uh, in the dressing room. Charge of the fines, charge of the fine book. Always had a bit of authority, but he had the banter as well. So he's had a, always had a sharp tongue, which is a good thing, in my opinion. So when, when he came, when he came uh, to AFC Wimbledon, I was already within the club, and he came in at Walton Hersham with Keith Ward and Noel Frankham and other people. Um, straight away, three massive characters come in, and we're like, oh, here we go. And it, 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 was, it was fantastic, because straight away... He's coming to the dressing room and he's seen Kevin Cooper and he's dug him out straight away for his haircut, his curtains. And I think he's called him uh, the Robert Rosario. Norwich, Norwich City goes, look at Robert Rosario in the corner. And it was fantastic. That set it off from the start. That, that is what he's like. He's, he's brilliant, but he won't let you get away with anything as well. So he'll have a laugh. it will be brilliant. He'll look after his teammates, but at the same time... When it's time to be serious, you've got to get your head on. And, and he was always good for that because when I, he's a little bit older than me and when I was on the left wing and he was on the left back, he'd be Miro. He'd be go, get in here, turn left, turn right, and I know exactly what I need to do. And when he bombed on, I knew when to sit. Because, and he just having that voice on the pitch, in the dressing room, and you know, I'm not surprised he's still here because he's fantastic. He's doing what he does to drive not only people on the, on the pitch but from a social aspect... He's heart and soul. He's a good lad. Kevin Cooper's here. Was he ginger? And was he dying it? Yes and yes. <laughs>
And what about some of the nights out you might have had as a squad? Because you say there were a lot of big characters. There was a that was a great team, the team spirit in those first couple of years. Well, it has been throughout really our time as Everton women, but particularly those first couple of seasons. Any stories? You've got any team team bonding sessions? Uh, yeah, I won't, so I won't say too much, but I'll just say there was a, a couple of times when uh, when we went out, there'd be some impromptu characters that turned up. So we went to uh, Infernos in Clapham, or we ended up in Infernos in Clapham. And I think uh, Bass's mate, Ben Thatcher, uh, came along. And I, I, I can't be certain, but I'm sure he had a game the next day for a certain Tottenham on the TV televised sub- subject with Glenn Oliver's manager but um, apart from that we, uh, we didn't say too much but um, we had some interesting nights out but the, uh, the big characters were Sean Daly um, Ginge Gareth Graham um, Danny O'Kins Lisa Bob. We, we were really lucky actually we had a good good bunch of lads who mucked in even you know Lee Passmore and some of the residents came in as well so we had quite a good squad and everyone came out and it was good fun and games especially when we went on the end of season tour to Blackpool as well that was uh, carnage I don't, I, think, I don't think the club's been allowed to use that same company that we use on the way up but <laughs> yeah I wasn't going to ask about Noel Franklin and perhaps any nudity but yeah we will stray away from that one um, you stayed with us for about just over two seasons didn't you you, you were here to when Dave Anderson came in and then it moved on um, it was a difficult one for me because um, for a regret coming maybe it was just bad timing because I got a bit of a calf strain at Dagenham and um, you know, I got on really well with Dave Anderson and everything was changing and I, think I felt the pressure of being injured not being in the side I could have waited, but I wanted to get into a side straight away. And you know, if I look back now, I could have, could have just been more relaxed about it. But I felt the pressure. And I think Kevin Cooper went, and a couple of others went around me. And uh, I, I went to Car Shorten with uh, Billy. What's that? I can't remember the name of the manager now, but I went over there. But I didn't, I didn't really have the heart. And I went to Whiteleaf in the end and played against Dave and the guys that season. And. Uh, it was, a, it was a little nod and wink to Dave said he stayed. But, you know, we, we never know. We never know. And what about now? What are you up to now? You're down here. I should explain. You are down here at Kings Meadow for our first ever home League Cup tie against Brentford. But what are you up to now? Are you still in football or, or not now? Yeah, so I don't, I don't play football or do any football at all apart from what my son Jude does. So I coach at their local club, White Grove in Bracknell. And um, I play football for Binfield Vets um, on a Monday night. So uh, there's various Vets teams that want me to go and play for them around the area, like Ascot and Wokenham and Bracknell. But um, I think I'll stick to six aside where my knee can cope. So, uh, yeah, that, that'll do for me. I think I played 90 minutes once for one Vets side. And I was like, I don't think I could do this anymore. <laughs> But um, no, I still love the game, and uh, with Charles have a little kick about, I'll, I'll do it, absolutely. And now, just as we round, wrap up, thank you very much for your time. A couple of final questions we've got. We've got a new game on the podcast this season. We call it Play With, Sleep With, Avoid. We're going to give you three names. We'd like to pick which one you'd most like to be on the same team as. Sleep With. So which one you'd like to room with on away trips. And then finally, which one you just completely avoid. Your names being... Danny Roberts, Simon Batty, and <laughs> well, Simon Batty and Sean Daly. Oh, tough one. So play with Batty because we have, and uh, oh, I would have to avoid Sean Daly. Yeah, because he's got a better body than I've got. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And then our final question, quickie the raw one. When you're making a cup of tea, do you go with the tea bag first or the milk first? Tea bag, absolutely. Good man, good man. We had James Shaw, our former goalkeeper, who said he puts the milk in first. Shocking. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And thank you very much for your time. That's great. Thank you very much. Enjoy the game this evening. And hopefully we'll see you around Kings Meadow again this season. Last week, Jimmy Abdu met up with Peter Fear, which, or I should say who, perhaps, Stu, I'm not sure, you correctly guessed following the anagram clue. I did. You did. Let's see if we can make it two out of two this week. Jimmy has, during the week, travelled up to Manchester to meet a presidential 
ex-Wimbledon midfielder. That is your first somewhat cryptic clue. Presidential? So, oh. Well, I don't know. I was just thinking, if you're president, you've been elected. Elected? Mm, sort of. No, I, I don't know. All right. This is an Irish international who scored four goals in 35 games for, well, as he's an Irish international, Ireland. Oh. I will clarify, the Republic of Ireland. Oh. Okay, so I'm trying to think. Who do we have? We had David Connolly. We had John Goodwin. I think it was Irish. I swear David Connolly played more games. Oh, Kenny... C- oh. oh, I don't know now. Irish. Doesn't, that narrows it down. That makes it a bit easier. But I still can't work out the first clue. Um, I think David Connolly scored. Actually, no, I don't think... I'll go with David Connolly. David Connolly. Okay, well, you've still got one more clue from which to change your mind. The final clue before the anime Despite his four goals in 35 games for Ireland, he only ever scored once for Wimbledon. However, my brother, Chris, was falling over himself when he did oh, score. Oh, crikey. John... No, John couldn't have scored more goals than that. Irish international... They kind of scored more goals than that for, for Wimbledon, didn't they? So... Do you get the part where Chris would have fallen over himself? That was at Bolton, wasn't it? Mm. I can't think who scored up there. But it might not have been that game. Ah, uh, okay. You stubborn on this one. I'm trying no. to... Just for the record, it was Patrick Aguimang and Kevin Cooper at the 2 2 game, which Chris fell over. Just uh, for the record. Have I ever mentioned no, that Chris no. fell over at Bolton? You, you have. Um, I'm a bit stumped on this one. No, I'll wait for the anagram, I think. The anagram of them. Rank Dyke Men. <laughs> No, I think this is why I'm so tired this week. I can't. No, David Conney, John Goodman, who else? Kenny Cunningham, who else is Irish? Well, there's lots of people that are Irish. <laughs> Terry Wogan is Irish. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know at some point, everyone, it was Irish. Uh, um, oh, I forgot his name, was Jackie Charlton. Jackie Charlton? Jack Charlton was trying to get to play for Ireland. No, I'm stumped. I'm done on this one. Stumped. You're going to kick yourself. Oh, no, go on. Mark Kennedy. Wow. Damn. That was a somewhat... The, the presidential. Oh. Yeah, see? You see? Mark Kennedy. And he has... Joe you know what? He was involved in one of my best moments ever watching Wimbledon. And it actually wasn't even in the game. This was Blackburn, was it not? This was Blackburn where him and Brandon Thatcher belatedly tried to take out as many kids in the Blackburn end <laughs> and were told off by stewards. Blatantly did it. <laughs> The best moment, and it actually wasn't even during a game. Mark Kennedy. I have sympathy for those children now, after what happened at Scunthorpe, where we nearly had our heads taken off by an errant shot. From, from our own team. Was it? Yeah, from <laughs> our own team. Who was it in the end? It wasn't Dean Parrott at the end. I don't know. Cody I don't know. I don't no one gave me any clue. I, I actually thought, I actually ducked into the ball. But yes, I'm, I'm sure they didn't see us uh, with our backs to goal recording. Mark Kennedy. So Damn, sure. I can't believe that. Yeah, there you go. Oh, well, what up? What up? Mark Kennedy. His, his one goal away at Bolton in the League Cup in 98. And so such a disappointing player, wasn't it? Well, the, the, the talent he had and the best he could do was take out a kid at Blackburn. Didn't really work, did it, for him? No. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it just happens. It doesn't quite work for you at a club, but there we go. Right, this weekend we host Shrewsbury, or Shrewsbury, or however you want to pronounce it. They were beaten 2-1 in the week by Notts Forest in the League Cup inside the 90 minutes. But they did take three points from their first league game last Saturday. Christmas came early, thanks to a Lanil John Lewis injury time winner against Northampton. We have to have this game down as a win, don't we, Stu? Yeah, it, it just depends how much the, the 120 minutes took out of us. I don't know what... I've I've got a feeling that Jimmy Abdu and Liam Trott will be back. I, I don't think their injury was as bad as we make out. I think they were always going to be, not drops, but I think rested. So you've got to manage them correctly. I've got a feeling they will come back in. Hopefully it'll give us the extra legs. But yeah, the 120 minutes sort of means the game could be a little bit flat. But I'm going, for, I'm going to go for a 2-0 win for us. I was just looking at the Shrewsbury squad. Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury. However, I don't actually care. Um, they've actually got some talented forwards. I think we are very familiar with Junior Brown, formerly of Fleetwood, in their midfield. But you look at AJ Leach-Smith, who was the former crew striker, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Played against them. John Lewis, who we've mentioned, who scored. Louis Dodds. Louis Dodds, ex-Port Vale, is that right, if I remember properly? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, but yeah, is that going to... 
Are you are you worried about that? Does that give you nightmares? No, and I was, I'm fully expecting Shrewsbury, as I said, I've predicted them to go down, but I just think it's another indication of the strength of this league. I think it's a much stronger league this year because you look at some of the names in their team. Sean Wally's another name I'd mention, Alex Rodman. These are experienced players, and I just think, all right, I just they're going to struggle. But I wouldn't say, I, could, I shouldn't really say this, actually, if you consider the teams that got relegated last season. I don't think we scored against Swindon in either game. We lost at Port Vale. We drew twice with Coventry. We drew at Chesterfield. So, you know, OK, our record's not great against these bottom four, but they're essentially no easy games. No, but if you're going to have a game at this stage of the season where we want to get our first three points on the on the board, first home win, all those sort of things, Shrewsbury coming to town is probably the best we can hope for. They've never won at King's Meadow either, so there you go. Well, that's jinxed it. Well, to be fair, I did say, to be fair, that... We never lost at Glanford Park ahead of last week's trip up there. So yeah, I've been there twice. Seen us. Yeah, I've been there twice. Seen us win one 0 in the FA Cup replay and a one all on Saturday. Yeah. So this is as AFC Wimbledon, of course. But you know, I fancy us though. Like you say, yeah, I fancy us to win this one. It's going to be one or two 0 I think. I am pretty confident. Any other fixtures from the weekend that have taken your fancy? Um, I have done what is known in the podcast game as a stew because I have forgotten to look. <laughs> so I'm going to do that now. Oh, no, see, I did I did quite well. I looked this time. So I'm looking at the Battle of the Rovers. So you've got Blackburn at home to Doncaster Rovers. Um, interesting game because Blackburn's first home game in League One. Doncaster won at Bradford in the Milk Cup on the weekend, on a week, sorry. Uh, but obviously, they had a disappointing game against... Um, well, I'd expect them to beat Gillingham. I think Gillingham obviously would be uh, the team that would be competing with Shrewsbury for bottom of the league. Um, but I just fancy that. I think it would just be interesting to see how Blackburn, how Blackburn adapt to being in the in League 1 again. Uh, Oxford Pompey, battle of, the, battle of the big clubs in League 2, renewing their rivalry. That's what I look at. I think it's a fascinating one because, as we said, Portsmouth got to a good start, as did Oxford. They both got to good starts, but they got against teams that you'd expect them to, really, in respective fixtures. But they are both... Well, I've ticked Oxford to do very, very well this season, whereas Portsmouth are the ones that most of the media seem to be backing. So I think it's a fascinating encounter. Having said that, it'll probably end up being nil-nil and they'll just cancel each other out. But I don't <laughs> think either of them would be particularly upset if that was to be the case. Uh, any others that tickle your fancy? Uh, Alexa Bliss. <laughs> oh, you mean the fixtures? Fixtures. Um, Plymouth Charlton. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Plymouth at home for the first time in League One. Uh, there's a Sunday fixture, which is um, quite interesting. Oh, this is because, sorry, actually, thank you for reminding me. This is the ludicrousness of Sky needing, feeling the need to put a League Cup game on the Thursday, which means that a Championship game and a League One game had to be moved to the Sunday to accomplish. Nobody wants to watch Barry Sunderland on a no. Thursday night. No. Nobody. No, but you could see Barry winning it. Could do, yeah. You could see him winning it. But, um, yeah, Wigan Barry, Barry's first real... If Barry are going to do anything in this league with the money they've spent uh, or do anything before Christmas, before they go bust uh, or sell, then this is going to be a test for them up at Wigan. Yeah, Wigan. It's going to be very interesting. And a, ma- and a, and a Manchester derby as well. They're all, they're all Manchester based, aren't they? I've forgotten who we're talking about. Barry and Wigan, yes. Greater Manchester. Wigan, yeah. Wigan Barry, they're all, they're all, yeah, yeah, so, all great Manchester. Yeah, it's a, few, a local derby. There's a few in around that area, isn't there, this season, so... Definitely. Of course, updates will be available from our game with Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury, Twitter and Instagram at Nine Wires Podcast. There will be Facebook live videos as well, so we'll keep you posted on everything that's going on during the match on there. Make sure you like us on Facebook to make sure you're notified when we go live. That's facebook.com slash Nine Wires Podcast. Not just for those of you that can't make the game, of course, if you are at the game, you can be streaming it on your phone and getting our opinion, getting our half-time analysis, if you so choose, if you really want to. So it's up to you. Also, on all of our social media this week, there'll be links to our Spotify playlist. This week, it features tracks chosen by Jake Reeves. And also, remember to check out our website, ninewirespodcast.org, for this week's essay. Mark Hendricks is our writer this week. He's analysing our new style of play. Now, this is the time we'd normally think about waving goodbye, but Two bits of business to tidy up, Stu. First of all, big shout out to Ruth Langsford, who has announced, or it has been announced, that she'll be taking part in this year's Strictly Come Dancing. So good luck, Ruth. She is a friend of the show. She listens every week. Good luck. We shall be supporting Ruth, won't we? For the first week. Oh, come on. Have faith. I think she will do very, very well. She won't reach a second. Yeah, at least a second or third week. Also, got a one-off this week, Stu. We've got to play one more game before we disappear. It is a one-week return of the 
birthday game. Yay. Not my birthday, but yay. No, it's not your birthday, as we know. As we are recording, we are recording on Wednesday evening. Today is the glorious day. It is Alexa Bliss's birthday. So happy birthday, Alexa. Bless. Bless her. How old is Alexa as of Wednesday, the 9th of August, 2017? How... How old does she look, or how old is she? Well, let's let, give us both two. What do you think? How old do you think she looks, and how old do you think she actually is? Um, I don't know. She looks. Mm, I'm not going to be rude to a lady because she's a lady. No, I think I don't know. How old is she? Um, I reckon she is twenty-four. How old do you think she looks? Well, it depends what she puts on. Do you know what I mean? But days sometimes she looks really old. Um, no, 20, 24. 24 is my guess. Mm. You're close, you're close. She's actually 26. Yay, see? But as you know, I am a fan of the older woman. So you are. She's two years older than me, so that's all good. <laughs> yes, happy birthday, Alexa. You are 26 years old. In, so I hope she's had a great day. I'm sure she has. Okay, off we go then. Thank you for listening. Please remember to like us and subscribe to us if you're listening on either iTunes or YouTube. And if you're listening through our website, please feel free to leave a comment underneath and tell us what you think. As I say, that is it for us this week. Thank you for joining me, Stu. Thank you for having me. And join us next week when we will be discussing George Orwell's 1984 with Google CEO Sundar Pichai. Alexa Bliss, back first, milk last... And we'll speak to you again next week. it was interesting was because the only booking of the whole game surprisingly come for booking Jimmy Abdu for celebrating the winner random there's, there's, there's all sorts of, there's all sorts going on this Jim he got booked for celebrating the what? a winner no our equal no no it was a winner until Scunthorpe equalised there you are I got away from that one no not on any level because <laughs> Scunthorpe scored first ok so Jimmy I oh, don't know he did didn't he oh I don't know why I'm going with that one you can tell you can tell I'm tired from being out so late um on a school night.